But right now we are at the part of the session where we're going to present uh, reports from Ethical Bank Guide. Um, Ethical Bank Guide, the Norwegian Ethical Bank Guide, is a joint effort from Future in Our Hands and the Norwegian Consumer Council. It was launched in November last year, and today we are going to present the first case studies, which is also a part of this international methodology which uh, Ethical Bank Guide is, is built around. Uh, the reports are written by the staff of uh, Future Inner Hands in cooperation with uh, the Norwegian Consumer Council. Uh, Pia is the project leader of Ethical Bank Guide in Norway. She is also holding the position of uh, department, head of department for uh, business ethics in future on the hand. So you have your hands full. Um, uh, clear and also what's, what's mentioned in the little clip we saw uh, is pointing out that we should follow the money. And this is perhaps what you have done in the report. Could you please, Pia, come and share your finding with us? Thanks. Okay, first of all, thank you Mutang and Claire for telling us what the problems at the Borneo really are about. What you tell us is the reality. This is what happenings out there now. The problems are structural. It is not a question of some rotten eggs. So what to do? What can be done to change the situation on the ground? And this is a huge question, and I hope we, during this seminar, can come closer to an answer. What I shall do now is to show the extent of Norwegian investors' presence in five companies operating on Borneo in different levels and in different sectors. Um, yes, this is the, this one. I realize that there is a significant gap between the urgency of the problems we have seen and the more impersonal analysis of active ownership of the investors. In any case, we think that making the investors responsible and uh, making the bank customers aware of what's happening, the consumers, the, uh, the people that, that have this situation of the world in their heart, this is one of the instruments to create, it, uh, create the change. Now, Jürgen, you have presented me, so I will not so, uh, say so much about this, but it is important to know that the um, Ethical Bank Guide is part of Fair Finance Guide International. And uh, where there are also eight other countries, Sweden, Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, France, Japan, Indonesia, and uh, Brazil. In um, the guide we launched in November, uh, we included 13 Norwegian banks, and we analyzed their policy. Uh, the policy in 13 different areas from human rights, including, of course, indigenous rights, the uh, labor rights, environmental standards, controversial arms, etc. The goal is to create a race to the top, a competition not to be the biggest, but the best in ethical, sustainable issues. And this can contribute to create differences on the ground, we hope. Uh, this was the baseline study. I take it with me here because uh, it shows what banks are involved. And I stress again that this is only a question of policy and, uh, and the implementation policy. As you can see, the results vary very from the little ethical bank Cultura at the top, with Storbrand surprisingly close and KLP at a good position. And then you have Swedbank, Handelsbanken, Nordea, DNB, Danske Bank, surprisingly low, and to all the local banks, the Sparbanken, which have not yet understood their responsibility towards the investment that they uh, um, put forward to their customers. You can go into the website and read all about this. Now I will go on. 
Because uh, the Fair Finance Guide method is not limited to the policy commitments of the bank. After, after having assessed the policy, we look into how this policy is applied in concrete cases of violation of policy at different levels. The violation can be of different degrees of seriousness, but the question is always how does the bank cope with the problems? Do they have a system to find out what the companies uh, in their portfolio really are doing? Do they have a system to go deeper into the issues and on what level? Uh, and do they try to press the companies to change their behavior and in what ways? So the case study process starts with the problem. It starts to identify uh, what is going on on the ground. In this context, it is the problem uh, that we know and we have um, got the introduction to the destruction of rainforest, the human rights abuses and also corruption. The next step is to identify what international companies are involved with these problems and on what level. Then we go to the owners. Who owns these companies? International funds. Then which bank are involved in the companies and are offering these investments to the customers? In Norway, we analyze and find out uh, what Norwegian banks that is part of the uh, ethical bank guide and what banks are involved. Because the point is that after you have done the baseline study, you have assessed, you have a kind of, uh, what to say, a kind of structure for analyzing the policy, um, how it is applicated to these specific cases. And this, uh, for, for this study, it is about Buneo. So this is the case study, a little about the method behind. We have identified five companies as cases in this study. It's the Swedish-Danish company AA Key, the world leading producer of vegetables, fats, and a huge consumer buying of, buyer of palm oil. The accusation is lack of transparency in the supply chain, special concerning palm oil production from high risk areas. Also lack of proper due diligence of suppliers in relation to human rights. B, BHP Billington, the biggest mining company in the world, accusation that they have withdrawn out of a controversial coal mining project without proper compensation to affected communities. Just go and leave the problems behind. Deutsche Bank, which we have heard about now, and the accusations among others, to offer financial support to transfer money gained by corruption and uh, deforestation out of Sarawak into overseas company. That is only part of the uh, accusations. IOE, a huge Malaysian palm oil company, accusation there is that the production of, uh, of uh, palm oil on, on indigenous land forcing the people to be real allocated without the proper free prior informed consultations. And we have also in the Norwegian uh, case study, we have also uh, taken uh, with us Vilmar, which is also one of the largest oil palm plantation owners in Malaysia and Indonesia. Here it's a question of, of course, serious environmental issues, but also labor right abuses in many of its palm oil production sites. So, if we go to the overview of the Norwegian investments in these companies. 12 Norwegian banks have 4 billion Norwegian kroner invested in five of these five companies. We have found these investments in 125 different funds which they distribute to their customers. It is not so that you can go into a bank and see, oh, uh, how much do you have in this, uh, this company? It is a, a, a huge process also of, of research to find out the connection. These figures are based on analysis of the most recent content of the fund available. These holdings are changing for financial reasons. So when they change, you have new figures. 
And we will also take the oil fund. They are in uh, three of five companies. Uh, and it is 16 billion kroner. That is four times more than all the banks together in the five companies. And uh, to, uh, all together it is 20 billion. And you see that it is a huge, huge amount of money. I'm sorry, I didn't translate these figures to dollar. <laughs> but it's much. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Um, we have done two, two reports, also one report on the oil fund, and I think this is a good, uh, good moment after you have seen this to, to talk a little more about it. Because here you can see, um, I don't, is it possible to see? Yeah. The gray part is where uh, the bank is not uh, invested. And you can see it is also a big, a huge difference of how much every bank and if every bank is in every five of them or only in one or two. Um, this fact about the, and you can see that the oil fund have excluded two companies. You have also some exclusion in Storbrand, PHB Billington and IOI. For the rest, uh, the reason why they are not present is more uh, purely um, financial decisions of who makes the fund. So no, uh, no ethics involved. Okay, we will have a, a closer look uh, on the Norwegian oil fund. But I, I must have some water. Okay. As you know, it is one of the largest sovereign wealth funds. I like to see it was, it was the largest, but then you have uh, Valuta and so on, and now it is number three, I think. But it is, yesterday it was 7,866 billion. It's quite a sum. Uh, it is, uh, this oil fund is invested in three companies in this, um, in this uh, case study. It is Deutsche Bank, BHB Billington, and uh, RRK, which is fallen out here. Um, the oil fund was invested in uh, IOI and Vilmar. In the period 2011 to 2015, uh, the fund divested from 29 palm oil companies because of lack of sustainability in the sector. But they keep the names of the companies secret and do not tell the reason for divestment on company level. We can suppose that these two companies are among these companies that have been excluded because they are no longer in the portfolio and it is not reintegrated. But we don't know it. So they will never say yes, they have been excluded. Because it is two ways to exclude companies in the oil fund. It is one which is open it is based on the Ethical Council's recommendation, or, and then it is the Norwegian Bank, before it was the, the Ministry of Finance, now it is the bank, that decides. But when it is decided, the names of the company are public. The reason for the exclusion is also public. Uh, so the publication of the recommendation is done also if the Norwegian Bank says, no, we will keep it. So you have a huge effect internationally and, on, on, and nationally on this uh, huge and, and very profound analysis of, of these uh, companies. But then you have the other way, which I would call the secret way of excluding companies. Because the bank does sector analysis and decides to do risk-based divestment. This general analysis is public but not the application on the specific company. So the names of the company are not public, that is why we don't find the names of the pan oil companies public. And the specific reason for exclude this company is also not public. And this we find extremely, um, well, we don't find it a good practice. And we think that they have something to learn from the best banks. The oil fund, uh, 
makes public because you know the oil fund is not uh, not it has developed and the, the oil fund has uh, been subject to a huge interest of the public opinion in Norway so we have been working now for i mean <laughs> since 1999 when the first portfolio came we have been working to change it so if it now seems good in some places it is because it has had an extremely attention towards itself and also because of the parliament which is uh, deciding the guiding lines so once a year the oil fund makes public the portfolio the list of the blacklisted companies recommended by the ethical council are also public also um, the whole reason what for the exclusion and also the votes on the general meetings are public. But we think that the uh, oil fund must be open in these two directions. First of all, it must be open with, with the risk-based divestment, the names of the companies, and the reason for exclusion. It must also be open with their active ownership with companies. Today, this is behind a total secret wall. They are saying it will destroy their relationship and their dialogue with the companies and they cannot say anything. So it is shot, nothing. So if we go into, we have gone into the oil fund and these five companies on Borneo. What do we know? We don't know nothing, anything else than the amount of the investment and the sector analysis. We have not found any relevant information in the votes in the General Assembly, which can say that it relates to the Buneo. We have sent the same 25 questions to the oil fund as to the banks, without getting any more information than written in their annual report. If they use their active ownership or not with these companies, it's not possible to know. It's a secret. And it's a very easy way to, to do uh, to, <laughs> to do ownership, because no one can control that you're doing anything. And the case study. It is two parts. The first part is a description of the five companies and the different cases they represent in Borneo. The second part is an analysis of the 12 banks in Fair Finance Guide Norway, which is involved. The only one which is not involved is Kultura. Because of principle, they don't invest in these kind of uh, global companies. The analysis, the analysis is based on the answers from the banks on a questionnaire. 25 questions were sent to the banks on their working process, how to become aware of the problems connected to the companies in their portfolio, what they do, do they do when they get the information, then specific, what do, have they done on these five cases. This gives us a first general description of how the banks are acting and under what circumstances they take action. When I say it, it is the first general description. That is why I say it is, because it is our first case study. It will be a kind of building block in our work, uh, which is going on in the years to come. So not before having more case studies and more details gathered over time, we will, if necessary, give points to the banks and try to rank their work in practice. This they have done in uh, Fair Finance Guide Sweden. We have not done it here in Norway. But we can classify the banks roughly in three groups, still then with significant differences within each group, but still. Um, yes, here. We have three categories, which we call now active. For, for, it is a relative, it is very relative when we say active. Then we have the one that have done a little, and then we have the group that disclaim responsibility. By the active banks, we have Storbrand and KLP, and um, then we find also Swede Bank and DNB. On the, the ones that have done little, we have Nordea, Handelsbanken, Danske Bank, and the disclaimer of responsibility, again, we have the uh, local banks, which are among the biggest in Norway, 
the, the sparebankene. All of these have access to information and to, uh, it, but they differ a lot how they use the information. For example, the actives have, can, we can say that they have a systematic way to deal with issues and take actions, even if we must also see and say that they do not always act. The ones that do a little start to have a kind of system in their way of dealing with these issues, but they are more passively letting external services providers monitor the cases. Uh, well, I've been so long in, the business, bus in this business that I have seen the, uh, how do you say, the screening companies and that have been growing and giving this kind of, uh, um, provide the information to the banks. It's a very interesting case. We could talk more about it later. And then you have this disclaiming responsibility. I think the, this, uh, this part of these uh, local banks say, will say, oh, you are unjust. We follow, some of them following the blacklist of the oil fund. And uh, they also expect the fund manager to comply with guiding lines. So they feel that they have done everything that they can do. But we are pushing them and we uh, want to show that this is absolutely not enough. When you offer a product to the customers, you have to take a responsibility for, for the content of that product. So, um, yes, this uh, I just don't, I didn't remember what I've done. Yes, but this, <laughs> this, this is very, very, very short. Uh, you can read, uh, read because it was very difficult to, to present so huge and so many banks, but I will, will take just a little. For example, the AAP case. Few ban banks knew about it at all. That is uh, the BHB Billington. All the banks knew about the allegation, except one that had already excluded the company due to other reasons. And some banks also participated in a UNPRE-led collective engagement. Deutsche Bank, this is very important and interesting because four banks are aware of allegations but have not acted. One issued one alert uh, six years ago, but we can say it is little or no action. So it is something with the banks and other banks. I think that's an issue. They have clearly more focus on the palm oil companies. KLP excluded IOE, but have reintegrated the company. It is still excluded by Storebrand. And it is clearly that these two companies, Storebrand and KLP, and maybe also others, are working with the issue in and a little out like this. Most banks is aware of the allegations towards IOE. Two banks had been on field trip. One in 2000, some few years ago, one in 2011. Many ba banks have engaged, but mostly through external provider. This external provider of screening, ethical screening, are also, uh, can also be active. Vilmar, four, five banks aware of allegation. One have had direct contact with the company. Three have participated in, in a collective initiative and the rest in the report. Um, yes, I think this would go. <laughs> uh, conclusive comments. The banks in general seems to be unwilling or do not capture wrongdoings of other banks. I think this is a new era for the banks to think because they were thinking that, oh, putting the money into other banks must be a very safe thing to do. No. We have also the BlackRock uh, question where, for example, the oil fund was investing in all the blacklisted companies, which was in BlackRock, with billions, okay. Uh, the anti-money laundering and anti-corruption system in the banks, we're talking now, focus more on clients and less on the role played by the banks, as then the Deutsche Bank case shows. The waste majority of the banks rely too much, we think, on external providers of screening. And they have limited ways of fact-checking controversies if the service provider does not raise a red flag, because that is the system, how it functions. So uh, this was not done in the AAK uh, issue. 
Many of the banks are willing to talk about their dialogue with the companies. Storbrand and KLP publish elements from the dialogue also on their website. So some of the private banks shows now other banks and the oil fund that it is possible to do much more and that openness is possible in this issue. Yes. 